Hello everyone, Grzegorz Baran here. In this video I'm going to present full photogrammetry workflow for PBR materials, but this time with the texture used to carry color information for baking. In details I'm going to present surface capture with the monopad used for camera stabilization, raw image tweaking and micro shadow removal in Photolab 3, photogrammetry reconstruction in meta shape with the texture used to carry albedo information, how to build and align a low poly model for PBR baking in ZBrush to get clean height map without any cross surface gradient, texture baking with the Substance Designer Baker, manual seam removal, aerial tweaks and manual bug fixing in Substance Painter, how to generate a roughness map and equalize the color in Substance Designer, and at the end I will apply the result to my standard preview sphere in Marmoset Toolbag 3. I really hope someone will find this video useful and let's begin. As a subject of this capture I picked a quite generic gravel surface I found on a coastal path. I decided to pick that one since I really like the surface details. Photogrammetry as a technique seems to be the best way to capture surfaces with this level of shape variety. Since it is a quite a walked path, I was trying to pick the time of day without any people walking around. Unfortunately, this path still was quite busy. Due to inconsistent cloud cover and strong wind, the light wasn't very consistent and predictable. Use of the light reflector to remove direct shadows and to compensate constant light changes wasn't an option due to a really strong wind. In result, it limited the possible capture spots to those already hidden in a shadow already. Finally, I picked one in quite narrow part of the path. I unfolded the rulers to 180cm each and placed both of them to the ground as a scale reference and to define the capture area. Since the surface itself wasn't very complex and I didn't want to block already narrow walking paths too long, to speed up the capture I decided to stabilize the camera with a monopod. Next I grabbed the camera and used the X-ray color checker to set up the custom white balance. As you can see there were really a lot of people walking, but everyone was trying to walk around marked area or at least step over the ruler. I realized that bikes could be a big problem since they usually move faster and driver could not notice the ruler soon enough and accidentally damage it by driving over it. After I set up the custom white balance for the camera, I put the color checker as a color reference in the corner. I set the camera's aperture to 8, focal length to 35mm and mounted the camera on a monopod. The focal length should be constant for entire capture. I have noticed that when I move with the monopod, I move faster than usual and every step I move, I kind of hit the ground with the monopod. Since I use a zoom lens and the camera usually faces down, I risk that every time I move, the gravity can untwist the lens and change its focal length. To prevent this, I temporarily locked the focal length with the white electrical tape wrapped around the lens. To make sure I will not capture the monopod's leg and stay away from the area the leg might affect by its own placement on the ground, the camera's frame should be tilted slightly forward. I usually use my shoe to measure the distance from the leg to where the bottom frame edge should be and rotate the camera until my shoe isn't visible in frame anymore. Since the monopod has no arm, I usually bend it forward to get the camera positioned perpendicular to the surface. The monopod is a slightly less reliable way to stabilize the camera than a tripod. It is still way better though than using just our hands. 
Monopod as a tool helps to maintain the distance to the ground, but overall angling is a bit more random to tripod-based captures. The price we pay for increased capture speed is lower image quality regarding to the sharpness. Usually images captured this way are a bit more blurred to those captured with the tripod, and the level of blur we get is a bit more random. We don't know how good was the capture until we preview all those images on a computer screen later. Usually with a bit of practice for close surface capture like this one, quality loss is hardly noticeable and isn't very relevant for reconstruction. When the capture is well done, we still get more of reconstruction data to what we usually might need, but if I would want to be 100% sure that the capture is really good and we get 100% of what we can, I would probably use a tripod. Anyway, monopod used for stabilization is still way better and reliable tool to stabilize the camera than using just bare hands. It took me 8 minutes and 175 images to cover the surface. As you can see all the images I capture with the monopod used for camera stabilization look pretty sharp. But if we take a closer look we will find out that a few images look slightly blurred when compared to other but it is barely noticeable. The way to measure actual image sharpness is to use image quality measurement tool Metashape offers. We will do it after we upload all images for photogrammetry reconstruction later, just to compare the best and the worst image from this capture and see the level of quality inconsistency when we use the monopod for stabilization. So far I'm happy with the image quality and I'm sure it's way beyond what we need for the job. Next, let's process all 175 raw images in Photolab 3 to calibrate the color, calm down highlights and push dark areas up a bit to remove ambient occlusion shadows. And when done, to make sure we don't lose any information, let's export all images as 16-bit TIFF files. Next, let's bring all TIFF images into the meta shape and generate the high poly model. As I mentioned before, we can estimate each image quality to see how Metashape scores them for reconstruction. Value below 0.5 means that it's a total crap, everything around 0.8 is fine, image scored as one is perfect. Images I capture with the tripod used for stabilization are usually about 0.9. As you can see, the crappiest one is scored as 0.67, which isn't good, while the best one is 0.88. Let's preview the worst one. And the top one to compare. You can see that a bad one is a total disaster compared to the best one. This kind of quality might not even be enough for image alignment, but on this stage we can't do nothing about that. So let's start the reconstruction by aligning all the images in 3D space and building a cloud of shared points. With this setting it takes about 40 minutes. All aligned images are marked in align column with a tick. As you can see, all with even the crappiest one were aligned. By selecting the crappy image, we can roughly estimate which area it covers and pay a bit more attention to it after reconstruction is over. Or since we probably have enough information from surrounding images, we can even exclude this image from reconstruction if we really want to. But let's keep it as it is and start the actual photogrammetry reconstruction. Before we proceed, let's limit the reconstruction area by adjusting the bounding box.
And when done, let's proceed with the full 3D construction using depth maps as source of data. This reconstruction took 9 hours. In result, we have a 51 million poly heavy high poly model with the color information stored in vertices. In this case, I use vertices to store color information just to get better context preview when defining a low poly coverage in ZBrush later. To roughly check their construction quality, Metashape offers a model confidence tool. This is a heat map type preview which basically informs us how many depth maps were used to generate the points of polygons in certain areas. The heat map color goes from red to blue. Blue parts have more input information and therefore are more accurate and more detailed, whereas red areas have considerably less information on input and are less accurate. There are two ways to carry color information from the high poly model. Vertices are the easy one, but they have limits as they depend on mesh density. With the lower density mesh, we might not have enough vertices to cover every pixel of the target texture. From the other side, in cases when the mesh is very heavy, when we use FBX file format, it carries vertex color information just for maximum of 67 million poly heavy models. If the model is heavier, we need to trim it or decimate to 67 million poly. Otherwise, everything carried by mesh over 67 million polys will be black. The reason for that is that the FBX SDK during the file reading stores the color array information using integer data type. So the maximum number of vertices the color can be read from is about 33 million. The workaround for it will would be to use other file formats like Alembic, but these are usually not supported by standard texture bakers. The other solution is to generate a temporary high resolution texture, which will be used as an albedo data source for texture baking. This texture is generated just to store and carry color information to the low poly model for baking. As a source of color data, we can use images used for reconstruction and set the texture resolution into something way beyond our needs. It takes a couple of minutes to Metashape to generate full high-resolution texture to carry color information, in this case about 15. When done, we can export both the high-poly model and the texture itself and move to the next step. This is the temporary texture generated to carry albedo for baking. These blurred parts of the texture doesn't matter as this is the result of auto UV mapping in Metashape, which usually to avoid overlapping sacrifices some UV space. But since we use 16K resolution texture to carry this data, it doesn't really matter. Next, we have to create a low poly model and align it with the high poly one in 3D space. This low poly model will be used as a virtual canvas defining the area to bake the information from the high poly model into the textures. Let's bring the high poly model into the ZBrush. As you can see, 50 million poly is still too much for ZBrush and it can't bring it in. To fix this, let's jump back to the meta shape and decimate our high poly model to about 10 millions. When done, let's export it as a temporary high poly model and use this one in ZBrush instead. Bear in mind that this high poly model we bring into ZBrush is being used just to position the low poly plane. It won't be re-exported or reused. What matters is just its position in 3D space. 
the real high poly model will be loaded into Baker as a separate file anyway. When done, let's bring the temporary high poly model to ZBrush and switch the material type to something more readable. To create a low poly model, I use a simple one sided 3D plane. Next, I rotate it and scale to cover area I want to be baked. Since I aim to reconstruct 180 by 180 cm area, I try to cover it using captured rulers as scale reference. The density of the low poly model matters since it has to be aligned with the high poly for baking. If the density is too low, we, we won't be able to align it well enough and in result we will get a cross surface gradient which is really hard to tie later. If the mesh density is too high, we get too flat and noisy height map with lack of high accuracy. Correct low poly mesh density depends really on the type and complexity of surface we are trying to reconstruct. It should follow the main surface shape and curvature but shouldn't follow surface details as this should be handled by the height texture itself. When the low poly density is set I use a projection tool to make sure it is well aligned. For the ground surfaces, the main surface should be aligned with the ground level. This way everything what is below this plane will be darker to 0.5 on the height map and everything what is higher will be brighter. The middle value, which is a 0.5 for float or 128 for RGB, should be considered as a level 0. Following that rule for the height map matters especially when we consider any material blending and mixing in the future. The plane 3D is initially auto UV mapped in ZBrush. If it is not, we need to UV map it to cover full one to one UDIM space before we bake anything. When done, we can export the low poly model for baking and close the ZBrush. Now since we have low poly plane, the high poly model and the texture to carry color information, we can proceed with the texture baking. For baking, let's jump into Substance Designer and bake all textures we need. First let's bring the low poly model to run a baker on it. Next, let's set up the baker. Let's set our initial 51 million poly heavy high poly mesh as a high poly model. Let's set up the resolution file format, which carries 16 bits, anti-aliasing, output path, the name, baking distance and all the maps we want to bake. To get albedo generated from the texture, we need to pick a transferred texture from mesh and select the exact texture in parameters. A thickness map can be useful to generate roughness map later. When ready, we can hit the start render button and bake the textures. And this way we have textures ready for sim removal, surface logic rearrangement and bug fixing. Let's bring them to the Substance Painter and proceed with the manual sim removal. To start we need to bring all baked textures and a plane which can be used to paint on it and preview the result. It can be a simple square plane UV mapped to cover full one to one UDIM space but I have designed a bit more fancy one, which covers additional 20%. This additional space helps me to deal with the seam removal on the textures edges. So let's bring the textures and set up the material for seam removal. Let's remove metallic and roughness channels since we don't have any maps to cover them yet. Let's add channel for ambient occlusion and since we have nothing to handle thickness map, let's create a user channel to have it covered. Also since we use 16-bit source texture data, let's keep it this way and set up all channels to 16 bits.
Next, let's create a fill layer and fill all channels with actual data. Currently, the texture seams are on the texture's edges. Let's offset them by 0.5 for both axes to bring them to the middle of the texture space. This way seam removal is easier as we get better seam visibility. To remove the seam and paint the texture we need to add a paint sublayer and set each channel to pass through mode. Now, with Paint Sublayer selected, we can activate the Clone tool. With the Clone tool active, we can copy data from all PBR channel from selected area to another one at the same time. To mark the area to copy from, we need to select this area with V pressed. Next, by painting, we overwrite existing data. We can change the brush size with brackets if needed. Clone tool works also in both 2D and 3D view. With shift and right mouse button pressed, we can rotate the light around, which is very handy to preview the material. By pressing tab, we can hide interface. We bring interface back by pressing tab again. We can preview certain channels by pressing C. It is worth to preview each channel, especially when we look for bugs and glitches. With M, we can jump back to full material preview. There is a noticeable color inconsistency across the surface, but we shouldn't worry about that, as this is something we are going to remove with the color equalizer in the next step. Let's jump into the Substance Designer to generate a roughness map and equalize the color to remove cross-surface color inconsistency. Let's start an empty project with the PBR Metallic Roughness template and bring all textures there. Let's add comments to them so it will be easier to follow what I do. Next, let's plug them into proper output channels to get the real-time 3D preview active. I will rearrange windows so you can see what I do better. First, let's equalize the color using color equalizer. This way we should remove cross-surface color inconsistency visible when the texture tiles. We increase the equalizing power by changing the radius value, but we need to be careful as this way we sacrifice some of color information. Next, let's generate a roughness map. We can generate one using data from baked textures if we follow some rules. 
In reality, bright things are usually more shiny and polished, while dark are less. It means that we can use the color map as an initial base source of surface micro information to generate roughness. To do this, let's convert color into grayscale map. Since in roughness everything what is dark is rough and everything what is bright is shiny and polished, let's invert our conversion and plug the result into roughness channel to see its preview in 3D window. Next, let's calm level of variation from the color map down a bit with a high pass filter. Usually, places hidden in a shadow aren't as reflective as those exposed, so let's use the ambient occlusion map to multiply our roughness from the color. We can try to bring some surface height micro details using the third blue channel of the normal map. This channel is responsible for Z-axis information. Let's exaggerate them using high pass filter with quite low radius and blend it together with the previous result. I think we have quite decent roughness already, but we can go even deeper and add even more roughness details by multiplying the thickness map with the current result. Finally, let's add a level node to control the overall roughness level and tweak it until the surface doesn't look wet. When done, let's export all the channels. And test them all when put together in Marmoset Toolbag 3. Bear in mind that the workflow I presented is optional and there are many different ways and tools to do this job. I would encourage you to play with them and experiment to find workflow which works better for you. For those who want to dig a bit deeper into my photogrammetry workflows, there is an ebook I wrote a while ago. I will leave a link to it in this video description. I hope you enjoyed the video and found here something useful to yourself. If you did and want me to create and share even more videos like this one, please leave the thumbs up, drop a comment and subscribe to my channel. Big thanks to all of you who did it already. Thanks for watching and till the next one. Bye.